All right. Ooh. Uh, all right. We're back. Got a little excited there. Um, Who was here in Conspiracy of Kings Part 1? Um, show of hands. All right. Okay. We have quite a few returning uh, folks. And, uh, and the ones who didn't put their hand up are new. So... I'm going to read out this abstract that Erica put together because I think it's really good um, to give you a little framing. <coughs> so the session is Conspiracy of Kings, part two, uh, Anarcho Pirates United. When states intervene, it is to consolidate their power. So it is no coincidence that governments around the world have treated the pandemic as an opportunity to amplify police power, outlaw protest, and remind you to fear your neighbor. But what if some of the conspiracy theories that work to explain what's going on are just as misleading as mainstream media? The truth is out there, but so is a whole lot of bullshit. <clears throat> and of course, authorities realize that us being divided into believers versus non-believers Woke versus backward, proper lefties versus crazy conspiracists is one of the best ways to stop us from actually ganging up on their blue-blooded capitalist asses. So if we're going to win, we have to look at what we have in common. The problem isn't conspiracy theorists or Jews or Marxists or anti-vaxxers or feminists or refugees fleeing wars or Antifa or university student anarchists. The problem is that misinformation is helping to steal away our knowledge of collective history of struggle and cooperation. So let's stop it. Um, I would like to welcome on stage an, a renegade anthropologist, uh, anarcho-academic. Um, I am a little concerned about sign language for some of these things that I'm saying, um, but I'm, you know, I'm sure there's substitutes. Um, writer and editor at Sociological Review, um, currently affilia affiliated um, at the LSE, London School of Economics, but may run off to join the theater or start a revolutionary secret society at any time. Um, she is the author of Occult Features of Anarchism with Attention to the Conspiracy of Kings and the Conspiracy of Peoples. Let's welcome Spartacus Tonans, a.k.a. Erica Lagalise, a.k.a. David Dyke. Your warmest welcome. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Yvonne. There's my clicker. All right. Hi. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for taking time out of this amazing party to come you know, talk about politics, um, props. Um, I know Yvonne asked a moment ago, but I'm going to ask again because I want to get a good sense. Who was here yesterday? All right, okay, I can hold an audience, that's all right, that's cool. <laughs> and, and, but that, but that's still, still a lot of new people, that's still like at least half that's like wasn't here, so okay. So, yeah, this is kind of set up to be part two of a talk I did yesterday, but let's see. I'm going to redo the intro bit that I did yesterday, like maybe the first five or ten minutes, just to kind of explain who I am and how I got here and why on earth you should listen to me anyway. Um, so for those of you who were here yesterday, uh, bear with me, it's a bit repetitive. Or, or actually, you were here for the lecture on the art of memory, so you can like test me on, on how good my art of memory skills are and just, just how similar this intro is to the one yesterday. Um, yeah, so... Um, I'm here because when I was supposed to be doing my PhD uh, in anthropology on social movements in Mexico, uh, which I did also eventually finish, I researched the whole history of the Illuminati as well. Um, I did this because, partly because I am a nerd and I uh, am a bookish person, but also because I was politically motivated. I am, um, have a working class background and I was the first person in my family to go through graduate school and I found myself um, as a consequence of this class mobility experience with sort of one straddling two worlds, you know, with one foot in uh, the institutions of elite learning, London School of Economics, McGill University, and, and the other foot, you know, um, in, in YouTube. Um, a lot of my old friends and family members, you know, they were deep into the conspiracy theory stuff. And, uh, and I thought, uh, you know, the big thing at the time was, it was 9-11, now it's COVID and we can get to that later. But uh, at the time when I started this project, like uh, 15 years ago now, um, 
the big divisive question was 9-11, the terrorist attack on the World Trade buildings in New York, and, and whether or not that was possibly an inside job. And this, this topic was very divisive, stigmatizing, polarizing. Uh, what you had was you had some people that were enthusiastic to explore whether or not you know the the story we got on the mainstream news was maybe incomplete, um, and then other people who suggested you know the first group uh, were sort of proceeding wrongly, insane, bad, no good, um, and and I, I had sort of friends in both groups you know my my new friends at school my social science colleagues my proper lefty activist friends because that was my social scene uh, in the university. As I explained yesterday, I, uh, I sort of I came of age in the anti-capitalist social movements that we now call the anti-globalization movement, like the big demos against the World Trade Organization, the Battle of Seattle about 20 years ago. Um, all that got shut down shortly after 9/11. Funny enough, but um, I was part of a Zapatista Solidarity Collective. Does anyone know the Zapatistas? I asked this yesterday. We have so okay, so okay. So you know more or less the world I'm coming from a little bit then. Um, and, uh, and so these are my friends, the anarchists, the feminists, the anti-capitalists. Uh, I like them. I still like them. But I, but I didn't appreciate, I didn't think it was good how they were dealing with the truthers that would show up at our meetings. This would happen all the time. You'd have a, uh, someone come in and then raise the question of 9-11. Of and, and they would react like very terribly, like these people are no good, we have to get them out of the space, there's a truther here, I feel unsafe, uh, get rid of them. I thought, you know, if you don't agree, you know, I agreed with some of the critiques of the conspiracy theories, it's not like I agreed with everything the truthers were saying. Some of the alternative theories that these people were putting forward were no more compelling than what was being shown on the news. Some of these alternative theories also involved uh, wild logical leaps, uh, gaps in exposition. Some of them had some racist bits in it that were not too good. And uh, so it's, and I agreed with the general critique that's often made about conspiracy theory and that everybody made at the time, everyone including you know, Noam Chomsky you know, ha made a point of saying that these conspiracy theorists are, are asking the wrong kind of question. Uh, you know, ins they're looking for specific bad guys instead of looking at the structural systemic questions that bring us to this specific historical moment. And you know, I'm a social scientist, I like structural systemic analysis, I generally agree with that point, that's fine. But um, so it wasn't because I agreed with everything the conspiracy theorists were saying, but I thought if these people are showing up because they've decided they don't trust the government, they think that maybe somebody's profiting off of all of this, they don't trust the media, that's because they're critical thinkers. That's because they've you know, noticed things don't quite add up. But it's true that the media uh, skews things, and it's true that the government isn't always entirely forthcoming about everything that's going on. So. If people are asking questions, that's not something that should be um, punished or pathologized just right off the bat. Um, and you know, because where where are people supposed to get their information? If you're not a graduate student, where are you supposed to get your information about power and institutions in the world today? You know, you go to the internet, and maybe some of the stuff you find there is not the best stuff. But can you blame someone for looking? Can you blame someone for for doing uh, that work? And uh, and then it occurs to me, like, oh, I'm. I'm not limited to the internet. I'm now a graduate student. Um, I have all of this institutional power and status where I can, I can get to the, you know, I can I can do my own research like for real. You know, I can I can use the interlibrary loan system and get somebody to you know fax me scans of the correspondence of the leader of the Illuminati in French, translated from German, and just get it sent to my office. And I thought I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this deep dive and and. Um, and fact check all this stuff, and I, and I do, you know, and in the process, I, um, I find out that yeah, like some of the stuff that we hear about on uh, YouTube about secret societies and modern revolutionism and all that, like some of it is true and some of it is not true. Um, like I said yesterday, you know, like yes, the ruling class is trying to fuck us over. Like yes, they're trying to kill us. No, they're not lizards or Jewish or from outer space. But you know, <laughs> that part, you know. Um, 
And uh, yes, the Illuminati existed. Yes, they infiltrated Masonic lodges. No, it was not to create a world government. It was actually to try to bring down the government. They were a revolutionary uh, society. And how that story got turned around in and of itself started to be really fascinating to me as a research object. Like, because you know, I'd order all these books and I'd get them in, and you'd see, like, depending on what century and decade the book is from, the story of the Illuminati is different in that book. And I thought, well, that's a fascinating story. How does that happen? Why does that get turned around? Whose interest does, does that serve? Um, and, um, well, and um, so. Summary point, I, uh, I agreed with a lot of the critiques of the conspiracy theory, but I didn't agree with how my lefty activist friends were, were dealing with that. And I thought, you know, if you just, if you disagree with it, if you think people are getting misguided, have an argument with them, try to set them straight, organize a fucking workshop, you know, do what you always do, do something uh, to try to change people's minds, to try to bring people over to what you consider to be a more robust, you know, anti-capitalist analysis. Don't just throw them out of the space, because if you do that, you might just be throwing them into the hands of fascists, and, you know, then how safe are we going to be, you know? And, uh... I hate to say I told you so, but, you know, by the time the book comes out in, like, 2019, Donald Trump is running America. Things are looking pretty dark. Um, then next thing you know, we got COVID, right? And uh, I mean, like, uh, yeah. So, so the book is a success. Because conspiracy theories are a thing. Now the dystopian pandemic apocalypse was not quite the success like I was looking for, but you know, here we are. <laughs> COVID. Um, and, and like I said yesterday, I'm gonna and we can we can talk about, you know, the deep you get into the, the, the thick of it a little later in the discussion and stuff, but I will say just sort of one summary point about COVID and the states and stuff right now, just to kind of put it on the table, get it out of the way. Um, you know as it says in the abstract for the event, like states will intervene in any situation, not just pandemics, but including a pandemic, any scenario. They will intervene not specifically or primarily to mitigate human suffering, but to consolidate their power and control, because that's just how governments operate. Um, and you know, so of course, states everywhere are going to use the opportunity of the COVID-19 pandemic to fortify borders and amplify police power and uh, outlaw protests, like all the shit they want to do anyway, right? Uh, including, you know, reminding you to fear your neighbor and buy more stuff and scroll through the apocalypse and download shitty porn and play war games and buy more shit and make Jeff Bezos rich, send them to the fucking space and fear your neighbor. And, you know, this, this is definitely how they've proceeded and it's how we can expect them to continue to proceed. But, you know, none of this means necessarily that uh, as a consequence that, you know, anyone has invented COVID for that purpose or, or that COVID doesn't even exist. It could just be that, you know, COVID exists for all the stupid fucked up reasons that it does exist, which do have, you know, social and historical roots which we can analyze. And, and that people, you know, are capitalizing on it because that's what they do because they're capitalists. So the capitalist class are going to capitalize on the situation. So, um, and like, basically, so I'm trying to think about the two-part thing. So yeah, so yesterday, you know, yesterday what we did was we talked about the whole history of the actual Illuminati. It was kind of like, yesterday was the story of the Illuminati and secret societies in early modern Europe. And today is the story of the story of the Illuminati. And it does work best when you sort of hear and con contemplate the, uh, the actual objective history of the secret societies and this stuff before then talking about the stories about it works best that way. So those of you who are here for both parts, that's great. Um, today, I'm just going to give a very quick uh, overview, like very quick. So we, what did we do? We went over the relationship of magic and politics in the modern world. We went over uh, the role of secret societies or not in the development of modern revolutionism. We went over mm, the relationship of New Age spirituality and secular uh, social justice movements. And um, we... 
Yeah, I mean, we talked about math, we talked about witches, we talked about Freemasonry, we talked about all kinds of stuff. We talked about the Illuminati itself, which was a, um, very briefly, like a revolutionary society that was more radical than most of the time. They were going, uh, they were against the idea of private property, not just against the monarchy and the church, which Freemasons and many other uh, sort of critical thinking groups at the time were critical of the established order, but they didn't necessarily go as far as some of the people in the Illuminati. Um, and for all kinds of reasons that you can watch on YouTube later when you watch yesterday's lecture, uh, they you know, were persecuted and and dispersed, and at this around the same time, you have like there's the French Revolution, which uh, I will won't do the story of again. But y you at, at this around this time of the Illuminati and of the French Revolution, there's like a there the 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 governments and the monarchies of Europe, along with the Catholic Church, get together to try to stop like revolutionary inroads in Europe. Uh, because th you know the monarchies in Europe, they don't want the French Revolution to happen elsewhere. So normally, maybe these kingdoms and monarchies are more concerned are concerned about each other. And at some point, they be they realize that they have maybe more to fear from the people than they do from each other. And they actually meet and they have a congress in 1814, the Congress of Vienna, and they form the Holy Alliance and they decide they're going to cooperate across. Uh, monarchies to to ban certain kinds of publications, to deport militants, and basically cooperate in trying to stop a revolutionary workers' movement. And insofar as there is a sort of new world order that uh, emerges around that time in history, it's it's the Holy Alliance um, that that is sort of built up in response to many different revolutionary associations. The Illuminati just being one of many, um, and it's when it's actually when the 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 um, uh, the royal family of Bavaria starts their persecution of the Illuminati that they say, you know, all Freemasons are under the control of the Illuminati. And this is the first time you hear that claim, but at the f when it's first made, the claim is made by a government who's concerned that this revolutionary association is going to radicalize these sort of semi-radical kind of liberal Masonic lodges against the government. And somehow, you know, over a long period of time, uh, this story gets turned around. And instead of us being worried that, you know, or instead of governments being worried that the Illuminati is going to radicalize Masons against the government, we hear, oh, Freemasons are under the control of the Illuminati, which actually actually is the whole world government. And so like today sort of picks up there and then looks at how and why that story changes. Um, yeah, I'm going to drink water. When does it start to happen that this story of the Illuminati gets completely turned around? Um, one of the most uh, influential or sort of landmark books that uh, in this process is a book by Nesta Webster uh, published in the 30s that suggests that there are secret societies that are controlling like both right and left and the governments and the revolutions against the governments and uh, and then there's a connection made between these secret societies and uh, Jewish people and actually, traditionally, these, as we discussed yesterday, Freemason lodges, they wouldn't let Jewish people in. Um, so this is very much a construction that starts happening at the beginning of the 20th century. There's also another uh, pamphlet that gets published and distributed quite a lot at the beginning of the 20th century called The Protocols of the Wise Elders of Zion, which is supposedly written by a bunch of powerful Jewish uh, men who are admitting to uh, having plans to sort of control the whole world. And this, this pamphlet is quickly shown to be a forgery crafted in Russia, but nonetheless, it, it makes the rounds. And with, with whether it's Nesta Webster's book or the protocols, you know, we have to ask ourselves, there's multiple things going on. Like, I ask myself, first of all, with Nesta Webster, like, was she, you know, making an honest mistake? Honest, I don't mean to excuse it or say it's okay, but like, you know, what's the, is there, is it purposeful misinformation or is it like, do they really think that's what's going on? And I think both things are going on at this, 
time in history where you have some people that are uh, you know, getting s receiving this information and, and passing it along because they really think that it's true and they're very concerned about it and they want to tell their friends. And then there are other times when the people that are distributing the information are sort of knowing that they're perhaps misleading people. And you don't want to, especially you know, as a careful academic, you don't want to impute too much intention or, or um, to people who I don't know what's in their, their heads. But you've got to figure that both of these things are happening at different moments at different times. So, you know, there, in terms of the honest mistake, maybe people, it's e maybe it's easy for people to think that, oh yeah, a group of Jewish guys is doing this because there's already there's a long history of anti-Semitism. There's a long history of uh, a very long, complex history of anti-Semitism and racism against Jewish people in the Western tradition. So they're sort of an easy target, you know, in that sense. Uh, you just need to sort of build on it, elaborate on it, and then people are happy to have a scapegoat. Um, so along with just human error, mistake, histories of racism. You could just have sort of honest misinformation in that sense. But I think that there's also times where you gotta ask like, how are people consciously misleading? Um, and I guess that's my sort, of my sort of leveling up in the conspiracy theory game, you know? And that sometimes I give this talk a cheeky title like the conspiracy theory conspiracy, like where um, it's, act where like take somebody like, um, it's good to give an example. Take somebody like Henry Ford, okay? Henry Ford is a guy who, uh, Ford Motors, okay? With the inventors, uh, makes them killing, selling cars at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, he also sells weapons in the Second World War to, um, is a corporation that sells weapons to both sides. Um, and this guy also, um, he distributed like himself, like half a million copies of the protocols pamphlet. So again, as a like careful academic researcher, I can't pretend, you know, I don't, I don't want to go too far, overplay my hand, uh, go too far on a limb and say, suggest that I know what's in Henry Ford's head because I don't. But when this kind of thing happens, you've got to ask yourself, like, you know, if you really, if he really, really believes the contents of this pamphlet, like, why is he like happy to make money arming, you know, both sides in this war, you know? And to ask this question and to think critically and carefully and be suspicious of somebody like Henry Ford doesn't mean you don't got to like go all, run all the way out of the park with it, like go, you know, therefore, you know, Henry Ford you know, orchestrated the entire Second World War or he, you know, was a conspiracy, he, he did it. You know. No, he's just one motherfucker in a sea of assholes. You know, he's just a capitalist ass like everybody else. There's many people like him. Uh, they're not all super coordinated together, but they do have, in, you know, shared interests as members of the ruling class. And it's a very long and honored and tried and true tradition among those in power to kind of, um, you know, distract people from what you're doing, to be like, well, the ruling class collaborates across difference, you know? But they want us to, s to, 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 to blame uh, specific groups and, and divide, for us to pay attention to the divisions among us while they are happy to collaborate across these same differences. So yes, it's true that the ruling class is largely white, okay? And it's, and it's largely men, and, and these structural questions of power are very important and, and relevant. Um, it's cool to have a feminist anti-racist analysis of you know, capitalism. Um, but it's also true that when you get to the top and when you are thinking about the ruling class, although there is this structural patterns and they are real, um, the, you know, they're, they, they, they do collaborate across race, across religion, across ethnicity, across gender. Uh, they, they, they pass the money around, they, they lend each other money, they back each other up, they marry, they, you know, they do what they do. And, and meanwhile, they are, have for many, like hundreds of years, like used the tactic of um, inviting us to blame, recognize ethnic divisions, racial divisions, gender divisions, and to blame what's going on and, and how if, if things don't seem to be working out well for us and, and, and life is difficult and there's power to, to blame uh, a scapegoating a, a group while they collaborate across the same difference. I'm going to go back farther in history to explain this. So, okay, so 
to, f you know, go back way before the 20th century for a moment. Hold on. Okay, so like, take race and racism and, and seeing people as defined by their race. So there's a sort of certain common sense um, logic that is shared in, uh, by many of us naively and that is propagated by governments, especially those uh, governments that are trying to p put forward a sort of nationalist agenda or trying to get you to sort of, you know, um, fear immigrants and blame them for your problems and stuff like that. Um, that that people are, you know, naturally don't like difference. That it's normal um, it's throughout all times and places for humanity. It's like it's human nature to be to be afraid of what you don't know and to, to want to be with people like yourself and to not to not be with people that are not like yourself. And they sort of try to naturalize this tendency and then sort of naturalize racism by referring to this sort of long historical natural tendency. But this is not always true. If you study, you know, anthropology, you see like, yes, there's always, throughout time, there's always, you know, boundaries of identity and there's uh, cultural boundaries and there's difference and, and there's managed in different ways. And yes, there's war and, you know, it's not like all the bad stuff that humans do only starts a couple hundred years ago. No, no, no. There's divisions and strife and stuff before that. But the idea that people were um, defined by race in terms of color and and looks and stuff this is really quite new and it's something that is developed and um, purposefully propagated like during the time of the Atlantic slave trade and early modern capitalism so at some point uh, you know I, I can't do the whole history of capitalism I could try and fit it into a few minutes I don't know at some point you have like um, a situation where you have the British Empire and other powers in Europe, you know, they're they're going to the Americas, they're going to Africa, they're buying slaves, they're procuring slaves, they're going to the Americas, they're selling the slaves for sugar, they're getting sugar, they're buying guns with the sugar, and then they're using the guns to get the slaves, and then it's they call it the triangular trade: guns, slaves, sugar, and. And in the process, you know, there's this, it's, a, it's a maritime operation. And um, it's not just the British that are doing this, but I'm going to focus on the British as an example. I can't do the whole world history in an hour, you know what I mean? So let's just focus on the British Empire. They, um, they do this thing where they're like, they're impressing people onto the boats. The sailors on the boats in the British Empire don't necessarily want to be there. They're like commoners and peasants that were like thrown off the commons and are, are now turned into vagabonds and they're now they're sort of illegally wandering around and they're getting forced into workhouses and being impressed into the navy. And uh, they, 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 they're not like volunteering. You know, it's not a great life to be a sailor on one of these slave ships. Um, and what happens often enough is that the you know, white British prisoner sailor workers on these boats realize that they actually have some quite a bit in common <laughs> interests with the slaves that are being transported on these boats. And the sailors and the slaves get together and they, you know, throw the captain overboard, basically. And that's how you get, you know, Pirates. These days, when you hear about pirates, they're sort of sensationalized in Disney movies and stuff, and they're they're bad guys and all that. But pirate ships were largely a function of sailors and slaves realizing like they could you know cooperate because uh, they have certain shared class interests, and um, and this was a real problem for the slavers and the mercantilists who were trying to make money and do this triangular trade. They're like, these people keep ganging up on us and there's like way more of them than there are of us. Um, they'd also have this problem like keeping the workers in line um, in when they got to the Americas in North America. You have the situation where these, these impressed sailors you know, would get to America and we're going to see it later, man, and they'd run away. They, they didn't want to work for the imperial power that had sort of brought them there. And they realized they could have a better life if they ran off and, s and lived with the indigenous peoples of the land and who had long practices of adopting people into uh, their peoples and cultures. And so they'd sort of go native. And 
at this time, like people wouldn't even like I'm I'm using words like white workers, black slaves, indigenous peoples, because these are the categories that are now uh, make sense today. They're politically relevant. They've come to be very meaningful. Um, but at the time, the people that were involved, like they didn't they weren't they didn't see it that way because they didn't actually those divisions were sort of conceptually cultivated later. Like, in fact, if you look at the way they refer to themselves, they, they like some of these um, defecting British sailors, they'd call themselves Anglo-Powhatans or something. They'd refer to um, themselves by language. They'd be like, we're people that, like, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a someone who's, who's originally English speaking, but now you know, lives with this group that speaks this indigenous language. So they'd sort of, um, understand subjectively what they were doing they knew that they were sort of living and switching different cultural contexts but they didn't think of it in terms of like betraying their race or living with a different race of people they they th I'm living with people who speak a different language you know and it's just it's a very different way of understanding what they were doing and it's over a long period of time that um, the powers that be you know tried all kinds of things to stop this from happening. They didn't want the sailors and the slaves ganging up on them of the ships. They didn't want the sailors and the, the workers running off in the Americas once as soon as they got there. They wanted them to stay put and do the work that you know they were brought there to do. And so one of the ways that they tried to make sure they the, this would happen is they tried to divide these people against each other and they did it in very very specific very insidious you know very uh, effective fucked up ways you know it's just simple stuff really like some of it's quite simple like like let's say there's a white you know servant class laborer in a given house or uh, commercial context and you know um, black slaves they'd say this slave misbehaves, I'm going to whip you 10 times, you know? And all of a sudden, the, the white worker is going to get punished for th the what the black worker is doing. And they, they set these things up on purpose, and all of a sudden, it's now like in the, the, the white servant's like very real material immediate interest to now police his racialized worker's uh, activity, because otherwise he's going to get punished for what that guy does. And they, and they, they, they sort of cultivated uh, mistrust and hierarchy in very real, very painful, uh, eminent ways um, to try to divide the interests of these workers so that they would not gang up on the bosses. And they did it by cultivating a certain Again, it starts out as just very crude stuff, like I'm going to beat you for what that guy's doing. But over a long period of time, um, these sort of uh, differences start to become taken for granted and, um, and become culturally normative and politically normative. Um, and yesterday I talked about... I already talked about the witch hunts yesterday, but I think I'm going to do that again because that's like a good... This really... It's a good parallel because um, that's it's the same similar thing that happens with men and women as what happens with race. And again, I you know I am whipping through a lot of this very quickly. I'm uh, perhaps simplifying. So if any you know, forgive me for simplifying, but I'm trying to give an overview. Mm. So with the witch hunts. What I explained yesterday, we were talking about magic, and uh, the context was about you know how supposedly the witches are being persecuted for magical practices, but at the same time as these women are getting burned for uh, practicing magic, uh, the the authorities, the states, like are actually employing people they call you know court magician, you know, uh, that are like specifically employed to do magic. So it's not really that the witches are doing magic, which is why they're being persecuted. And there is again, there's a sort of common sense idea that's uh, that we share. Um, sometimes where we think or we're invited to think that the reason why these uh, women were being persecuted as witches is because this is from some kind of earlier time before we got smart, before we learned about science and rationality. This is older, you know, barbaric, silly, religious people did these terrible things that we would never do. Yeah, not really. Um, the, the witch hunt started as a campaign um, promoted by the state 
uh, against women. It did not start spontaneously among the men folk where they just decided they were going to start burning their women. Um, the government specifically started uh, campaigning against the dangerous baby killing witch. It was, it was really, and this is very key, it wasn't just any kind of black magic that these witches were doing that was the problem. It was, it was baby killing magic. And like I said yesterday, it's worth thinking about this, especially now given all of the politics around abortion right now in different places in the world, uh, where women's uh, power over their reproduction is being taken away uh, again. Um, this is what was going on at the time, and it was because the commoners, the peasants, were being thrown off the land. The, the early enclosures of land in the capitalist or order were happening. There's no more common forests or meadows or things to get resources to live on, to get firewood, to grow food, whatever, the whole story of the enclosures, insert there. And so they don't have um, resources. There's a lot of people wandering around, vagabonds, the same guys that are getting impressed and thrown into the Navy because they're landless and they're vagabonds. Uh, they're wandering around and they, don't have a, they just don't have a lot of resources to have big, healthy, happy families. Uh, they're homeless and they're wandering around. And so they're having less children. The women have knowledge uh, as to how to have less children with herbs and various things. And they're implementing this knowledge and they're just having less kids. And, uh, you know, the authorities, they don't necessarily like this. They want there to be a new generation of, you know, wage slaves to fuel their industrial revolution and whatnot. And uh, any time in history where you've had like a womb strike, actually, anyway, this is very interesting. In Argentina, they had a womb strike during the dictatorship. It was very powerful. Um, it's uh, to deny the state children. <laughs> anyway, so they're, they're, they're worried about these women not having kids. And so they, they, they criminalize women not having kids. And they do it by cultivating the idea of this dangerous baby killing witch. And um, the way that they originally, you know, at first the men don't necessarily go along with it. It's a lot of bullshit. And they're like, you know, not every man is happy to sort of jump into this new order where we burn our women relatives. Um, they do similar things as along, along the lines of race, you know, where they make one person responsible for another. So, oh, so if we decide, you know, this woman in your household is a witch, you know, we're going to punish the men for not having turned her in earlier. And they set up things where all of a sudden the men now have to feel an anxiety about conforming to the this order uh, it's also true that you know there is an existing uh, power imbalance a gender imbalance there's a there is an existing culture of patriarchy in the Christian European world order and uh, you know if you give so men already have a certain um, power uh, culturally and politically and practically over women in this context and if you give people with power even more power you know maybe they're gonna use it so like you know, maybe a man is having trouble with a woman in his life and before he might have dealt with it one way and now he can say, she's a witch, you know? It's just too easy. Um, so the combination of an existing uh, gendered power and, um, and a specific campaign from the state to try to criminalize these independent, uh, the women who have independent power over their reproduction uh, slowly creates the situation where we have the witch hunts. And it really takes a couple of hundred years. You know, it, it, it's it doesn't happen right away. Um, it's gradual, but it does it does work, and it is, it's, it's a thing. And so, you know, just a small detour throughout, you know, 500 years of European history. Basically, you know, coming back to somebody like, you know, Henry Ford and the early 20th century and, and uh, you know, it's just, it's not like it's a huge leap to think. There's just a very long history, a very long, well-known history um, among anyone in power in the world today that if one way to maintain power is to uh, stop people from organizing against you is to have them have a scapegoat, to have them have someone else to blame, to invite them to... Uh, fight among themselves, to divide and conquer, like basically. It's like the oldest trick in the book. Uh, so it's not, you know, attributing Henry Ford or any, uh, you know, motherfucker like him, any specific great, you know, cosmic intelligence to imagine that maybe 
people have this idea like, oh yeah, we're the ruling class, we're making a shit ton of money, we don't want people to be are organizing against us, you know, let's invite them to blame somebody besides the ruling class, you know, whether that's immigrants, black people, Jews, women, feminists, or whatever the fuck it is. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say here is that I guess what I'm trying to say is let's look at like this activity itself as a kind of conspiracy. So instead of like you know giving too much power to the the conspiracies that are like inside the pages of the protocols of the elders of Zion, we look at the distribution of this material as itself a kind of conspiracy uh, to divide us against one another, and not a conspiracy in the sense of like a super streamlined like you know well-oiled like one pyramid like with one guy or five lizards on top that's directing everything but just the kind of the conspiracy that is uh, the stuff of, of everyday politics and all politics is in some way conspiracy there may be not one pyramid there may be there are many you know like the, the, the Ford corporation every corporation is kind of pyramid shaped you know in uh, the ruling class you do have a lot of these um, hierarchies with people that find themselves on the top and they're all kind of vying to stay there. And, uh, and as long as you don't like start saying like they're all integrated into like one all seeing fucking lizard guy from outer space, like you're okay. Like there is the corporate class, there is the ruling class. Um, and so, all right, so along those lines, thinking about conspiracy in that sort of level up way, you know, what about considering the category of conspiracy theory itself? as a concept that is used and mobilized to divide and conquer. So, um, which it clearly works well for. Um, the category conspiracy theory was specifically promoted, um, and this is, in the peer-reviewed academic literature, by the way, this is all, you know, I didn't get this just off YouTube, I promise. Um, it's all been sort of admitted, it's in the files, you know, the CIA uh, specifically had a mandate, has a mandate to promote the category conspiracy theory after the assassination of JFK to kind of designate anyone who is sort of questioning the official story. So, and I'm not here making any specific claims about what actually happened with JFK. I don't know, I'm just, I'm asking a different question. Whatever happened there, the point is, is that afterwards, you do have people that are talking about, you know, was it, uh, you know, like 9-11, like was it an inside job and all this, right? And this, there, there's a specific movement where the CIA says, okay, we're gonna promote this specific phrase, conspiracy theory, to talk about anyone who's uh, entertaining these alternative theories and, and, and do it in such a way where it's, you know, it serves to create a bit of a caricature and to um, pathologize the people that are having that discussion. And this is, uh, you know, true for, it, w it was true for magazines, TV, all kinds of pop media. And this does not, again, this just like, you know, Henry Ford with his pamphlets, you don't want to go, you don't want to, you know, take that extra step and go too far. You don't want to say, oh, well, then, you know, uh, the CIA, you know, created the entire concept and, and, and it's only because of the CIA and was all designed, you know, from the 50s and it's d the, the, no, the CIA is one, again, one, <laughs> one factor, one, they are a powerful agency, they do have an effect and an influence in the media, but they're not the only thing happening. So again, you wanna uh, appreciate and understand that there's contingency and multiple factors going on in history, but with, with that being said and understanding that, it is true that the CIA does promote this category on purpose to sort of, um, stifle debate and sort of frame debate in a particular way. And, um, more water. 
and it shouldn't be, you know, it, it's not, it shouldn't be too much of a leap to then think like, well, if that was true then, you know, if people, if the CIA and there's government agencies intervening in pop media at that time uh, in, and in that way, um, is it not possible or even likely that there's so similar interventions in pop media now uh, on the internet, for example? And uh, because, you know, I don't, this is, a, again, I'm a, I'm a respectable academic. I can only hypothesize. I haven't proven this. Um, but I do know that, um, you know, like the stuff about the CIA after JFK, like that's 50, 60 years ago now. So all that shit is like in the files and it's all above board. You can research it now. What's happening now is still uh, a bit opaque, right? It's difficult to research. But you can see like in, there are like, academics that published themselves in the peer-reviewed press like at the beginning of the 21st century like in 2000s early 2000s um how you know this internet could pose a problem you know there are people on the internet that are like you know sharing information that could be detrimental to the state you know there and uh, and so what is the state's responsibility to intervene to protect you know the state's interest in this case like neoconservative uh, political scientists like talking openly about how it might be you know uh, ethical and res morally responsible their duty in fact you know to sort of prevent you know people getting too misled or uh, misled by sharing information independently, you know, on the internet that could damage the authority and legitimacy of the state, uh, with, su with the suggestion being that like they should intervene. So, and again, I don't, I don't want to go too far by claiming I know for sure how much of this is happening, but. I could hypothesize that maybe it is. I know that I'm, s you know, I'm someone who first did my deep dive on YouTube and watched all the stuff like in 2006, 7, 8 when YouTube was quite new, and uh, and the, the the conspiracy theories that I saw there. Um, I can't say I reviewed every single one, but I mean, I <laughs> almost I went and. They had a particular character, you know. There was there's a range of them, you know. There were uh, there were ones. Um, a lot of the ones around 9-11 were, were, they were just like, we don't necessarily buy this 9-11 story. We think there was something else going on. There's many different alternative, you know, things about the science and the buildings and all that shit. But in terms of like the larger picture that they're painting and who's in charge and what's really behind it, you know, they're focusing on the oil trade, like oil guys and the finance um, industry. And, and some of that, is like you could see it was like a euphemism for like an anti-Semitic, you know, like bankers thing. But some like some more, some more and some less. Some of them like actually went there. Some of them like had you know involved the, you know, the 9/11. They tied that to the Federal Reserve, to this, to that, to the Freemasons, to the Illuminati, to the Jews. And they just went all the way to the fucking lizard people, and and some of them didn't. Not all of them did, you know. Some of them were just like, "Hey, it looks like there's some oil guys that are making money off this stuff," and be while we're being told this, and how does that make sense? And uh, some of the documentaries, you know, had fairly, re you know, fairly mundane uh, proposals that were just like, um, "It's the governments ganging up on the little guy," you know. And the, the categories in play were like capitalists, oil guys, governments, media, and then like your regular guy, you know? And, and, it, and it was gendered in that way. But um, but if you look at like the conspiracy theories, like, you know, it's just like 10 years later when I went back and started watching them like in the lead up to Trump's election in 2016, 17, 18, like the whole character of these theories like had just, instead of it being like the oil guys, against the regular citizen it was like a globalist conspiracy against america and all of a sudden the victim was the american and it was like nationalized and 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 it, there was all this, this this christian motifs and the book of revelation and it was it there was a lot of new stuff and things had gone in a in a in a particular direction and and as you know an anthropologist and you know, there are many, again, and it's like the theme here is there are many factors, there are many reasons. You can't attribute this to one thing. Um, there are many long-standing cultural factors, existing questions of racism, existing prejudices, 
local fears, none of that would go into perhaps spinning conspiracy theories off in this particular direction, but maybe one of these many factors is actually intervention um, to try to dissimulate. But the summary point is basically like, even if so, even if you know, there is some intervention and it's being done on purpose and it's to sort of uh, mislead us, um, even if so, we what we want to do is we always want to steer clear of then attributing like more power than they really have to like any given individual or group. So whether it's the CIA or Henry Ford or someone else, you don't want to say like just because they're involved and they seem to be um, acting in a particular class interest and th that they are therefore like have full or total power or control and are therefore controlling everything. Um, there is contingency in history, and this is one of the things that we, people who find conspiracy theories frustrating and just uh, uh, and sort of talk about the category you know accept the existence of the objective category conspiracy theory um, the CIA, you know it, it really does work we we know we now kind of use this word as if it has a self-evident content like conspiracy theory yeah we know what that is but actually you know it's a very um what you call in the academy a polythetic category. If you look at it carefully, there's no one thing that kind of all conspiracy theories have in common. Uh, it's a constructed category, and we use it. Um, and 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 and, but insofar as it is a relevant objective category to use and apply, um, one of the things that arguably characterizes it that is frustrating to the people who don't like it is that it it, it attributes a lot more power to sp to individuals than maybe they reasonably have. It suggests that you know certain people can just, it has what, what an academic, what a s proper social theorist would call a voluntarist approach to history as opposed to a structural analysis of history where like the idea is that history happens because you know some guy has a great or terrible idea and can just make it happen you know, as if there's not a million institutional logics, structural logics and stuff that are in play that are guiding and shaping and preventing and encouraging certain kinds of action. Um, and like, you know, in social theory, this is, yeah, it's thought of in terms of voluntarist versus structural uh, analyses of history. Uh, sometimes the language used is like structure versus agency. And basically, you know, in social theoretical terms, if you look at conspiracy theory, like, it's basically, they would say that it attributes too much agency to specific people in power. And, but is there a, there's specifically one, there's a, speci there's a social theorist that is really, really influential and powerful in the academy in the past couple decades. I don't know how many people here are, you know, um, university students, but who, who knows about like Michel Foucault? Is Michel Foucault a familiar name? Yeah, okay, a little bit. All right, yeah. So, you know, he's a very influential guy. He has a, his sort of intervention, uh, you know, Foucault in 30 seconds. Uh, his intervention in social theory about power is largely about how power is dispersed, you know? The power inheres in institutions and discourses that sort of limit and constrain, like, even, you know, very powerful people. So you could be a professional class person, but you're still going to be constrained by either the discourses and frameworks of understanding that you inherit that are kind of uh, offered to you and that you've been socialized by and that uh, and that there's going to be an, uh, and even if you kind of manage to think outside the box in that sense that there's ins institutional logics that like prevent um, your independent and uh, liberated action and in some ways this is a very important idea um, it is also a very convenient theory of power like for professional class people because then they can say that you know the world is fucked up because of the sexist and racist janitor because like they have no power, they can't do anything. Uh, you know, I'm constrained. Uh, the discourse and institution is stopping me from. You know, it wasn't me that like hired the white guy over that really talented black woman. It was the institution that did it. You know, like they can kind of um, mm, exonerate themselves about the agency that they actually have and that they are not using for good. Um, so you can kind of do a social class analysis of Foucault, if you ask me. Um, you know, there are other social theorists, like a different kind of style social theorists would be like Bourdieu. Just who knows Pierre Bourdieu? That would be like more, okay, I'll feel that. that makes sense. Okay, feel that. So I like Bourdieu. Anyway, um, he's, he's a different kind of um, 
theorist of power, and he, he says, you know, the, the ruling class, they do have a lot of agency. He's, he's sort of, he, he comes from a working class background, and he's saying, you know, these guys, they are kind of conspiring against us. They're always lending each other money, patting each other on the back, just doing each other favors, you know. You don't need secret societies to do it. They just do it anyway. These ruling class fuckers, they always are in solidarity with one another. They think they're better than us, and they're always doing this. But they, but they like to think they don't do it. They like to think they're, you know, liberals and fair and egalitarian, and so they misrecognize what they're doing, and they tell themselves uh, that what they're doing is for a different reason, but actually, they are um, performing like ruling class solidarity all the time. Um, and in a way, like Bourdieu is continuing like a long tradition of thinking about power and social theory uh, where you understand that ideology plays a role in the sense that we are not always we don't always have full access to understand what we are ourselves doing. So Bourdieu uses the word of misrecognize. But um, if you go way back to you know Marx and, and and everybody sort of in between Marx and Foucault, um, there is this idea that like, and it's it's a it's a it's a very clever insight that like there are people that cooperate with the interests of power not because they mean to or specifically consciously wanting to but because they're just they're just going to work um, they don't understand how they're they don't have full access to uh, to knowledge about how their own activities plays into systems of power and so they are at times reproducing structures of power and maybe performing ruling class solidarity or other kinds of solidarity um, without purposeful intention. And I think that that's sort of where, you know, conspiracy theory can fall short and where some kind, some social theory critique of conspiracy theory makes sense where, and that's where, you know, some conspiracy theories just go too far where it suggests that everybody who's involved in, you know, our, the higher social hierarchies that exist are doing so purposefully and with full knowledge of what they're doing and they're doing it maliciously. Uh, a lot of these structures of power are only able to be to reproduce and to continue doing all the harm they do because a lot of the people involved are um, thinking they're just uh, living everyday life and they don't see what they're doing as involving relations of power. And I could kind of go on a whole lecture about Marxist ideology for another hour, but that's not really why we're here. So um, I think I'm going to sum up by saying that, yeah, within your sort of proper social theory, you know, you're not going to be able to put forward the idea of like a super streamlined pyramid of hierarchy controlling the world, but you do have to admit um, it should be perfectly legitimate to admit that there are many, you know, pyramids at play all the time, and that people that are on top of them are vying to stay on on top, you know. And even, even if Foucault doesn't want to admit it, like that's happening, and um, and yes, the rich are conspiring against us. Yes, this is the stuff of politics. It's just that there's no, uh, you know, singular group of them. There is competition as well as solidarity among the ruling class. Um, the ruling class collaborates across difference while encouraging us to focus on the differences among us. Uh, this is one of the ways that they have maintained power for a very long time. Um, not only do they conspire in all the ordinary ways that they do, but at various moments, you know, bastards in the ruling class themselves will actually float like conspiracy theories uh, and other bullshit that, you know, blames Jews, immigrants, women, etc., uh, you know, for our problems, oldest trick in the book. Um, and then on top of that, agencies of the government, you know, will float the concept of conspiracy theory as a pathologized category, uh, as a form of propaganda in and of itself. And these guys are good, you know, even if they're not super streamlined, you know, ba you know, organized by one fucker on top of the Illuminati, they really do get shit done. Um, the combination of all that shit. And, and in terms of, you know, always promoting more forms of division among us, this latest conceptual division that we are invited to honor between the crazy conspiracy theorist and the proper analytical lefty is just uh, arguably the latest bullshit in this uh, motif. And, and it is, you know, in some ways powerful magic in that sense, isn't it? I mean, 
it does start to take on its own truth, right? Like maybe conspiracy theory at one point wasn't a phrase that even existed. It wasn't an objective category that we even recognized. Um, now it is, and now there are people that like will willing you know, identify strongly with that category actually, and there and there are people that you know don't identify with it, but 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 proceed as if like it exists. It's a self-evident truth that there is this kind of theory. Um, and there, and there really are some crazy conspiracy theorists. I mean, even if even if we are conspiracy theorists ourselves, you got to admit there are some people. You know, some of these theories are wild. Um, and you can admit this and also admit that ordinary liberals are also batshit insane, and that both things are true, right? Um, that some conspiracy theories in particular are really fucked up and uh, and racist, and we want to intervene, and that's a good thing. Uh, but when we fall into pathologizing all conspiracy theory and acting like all challenges to government honesty and goodwill must be crazy conspiracy theories. We are ourselves falling into propaganda. Um, if the right has captured a lot of ground during the pandemic, coming back to the moment of today, um, it is not just because you know some people, as my lefty friends might say, you know, have started to believe in crazy conspiracy theories, which is also true in some cases. Um, it's because now even reasonable people with like, a very healthy skepticism of big pharma that used to be okay, right? Um, are now easily rhetorically grouped together with with uh, with people who think the world is run by alien lizards. Um, so now anyone suspicious of profit mo motives affecting health policy, which obviously they do, is called a conspiracy theorist and therefore insane. As if any distrust in government means you must also necessarily think that you know vaccines contain microchips and all the rest. So we have to be on top of this. Um, we need to challenge theories of capitalism that are racialized, that are unrealistic. But otherwise, uh, I would say to try to be generous, try to be a social scientist in some ways when dealing with uh, the c conspiracy theory and social interactions that you know erupt around it. Um, and I don't mean in this sense that it should be you know women's labor, like w women's job to do emotional labor, explaining stuff to mansplaining assholes or the job of people of color to re-educate Nazis or like anything like that. Just don't interpret generous in that way. Uh, but if you're not, you know, in specific danger yourself, uh, maybe make an effort to, um, to think about how to communicate across as many divides as possible to try to deal with and resist this newest um, enclosures of capitalism and how we're being, you know, relegated to the metaverse while the planet burns to a crisp and with politics being reduced to sort of one-upping each other on social media, making memes ridiculing each other while Jeff Bezos makes a gajillion dollars and flies to space. I mean, like for those of you that are frustrated by conspiracy theories, like yes, you know, point out how conspiracy theories may be wrong and you can feel self-satisfied by that, but you can also do the more challenging intellectual work of understanding how they are allegories. Um, and in the sense of like, okay, like take like a, a theories about, let's not, let's not start with COVID, let's start with something else. Like take, take something like uh, theories about organ trade in the global south. This is a very common thing we've got, like a lot of conspiracy theories around organ stealing and organ trade. And there, first of all, there is an organ trade, so it does exist. Uh, not every uh, rumor or conspiracy theory that exists and that circulates around, um, what's this? Well, we, I, gotta, I gotta stop talking because we have a, we have a time for talk, time for a... Nine more minutes and then Q&A. Okay, no problem, I'm almost done. Don't worry, I'll shut up. Um, where was I? Yeah, so not every conspiracy theory that exists around um, organ stealing uh, is itself s substantiated, um, although there is a trade. It's not, there are also a lot of cons specific conspiracy theories that are quite sensational that have erupted around this stuff in different Global South contexts, and, uh, and they're, not, they're not always, you know, tangibly true, but even when they're not, I think it's important to understand how they index, like a perceived rupture in the social contract. They, they, they show us just how people are feel and know, and they are right to feel and know uh, in these Global South contexts, that their lives, their bodies, their blood, their sweat, their tears, their very physical being is being stolen from them to resource the Global North, you know? 
So maybe it's not actually the kidney is stolen and shipped off, but like their, their, their lifeblood is being stolen from them. And so these are sort of, they kind of erupt as allegorical critiques of you know, colonial capitalism. And you can interpret them generously in that way, and in that context, I think that really makes sense. And in a similar way, you can approach uh, some of the theories about, let's say, COVID vaccines and microchips. You know, like maybe the vaccine doesn't actually have microchips in it. Maybe it does, but maybe maybe it doesn't. But but even if it doesn't, if there's a lot of people that are like talking about this and interested in this idea and worried about it, you know, maybe that indexes the fears. The, quite legitimate fears that people have around growing surveillance and control via the pandemic as a justifying mechanism. So, you know, maybe the microchip isn't in the vaccine, but it's true that I, you know, in where I was in Canada during the pandemic, you needed a QR code to get in anywhere and they're collecting data and they're following you and they're creating markets with this data and they're using the pandemic as a way to try and trace your location all the time. And I mean, there is, they do take advantage of the situation to, uh, you know, experiment with new surveillance technologies, even if it's not in the fucking vaccine. Um, so, you know, you can like have someone come and talk to you about there being vaccine in the microchip and just think, well, you know, I'm sure there are, I'm sure I got a mixed crowd too. Like, and I'm sure, you know, I got people on both sides of this, right? Like, and that's fine. That's cool. Like, but so speaking to the people who, you know, find this idea frustrating, even if you do find it frustrating, you got to understand like that in some ways it's indexing a real fear and, and, I just think it'd be great if we didn't fall into um, completely ridiculing and, and hating on each other and to be generous. And just always remember that, you know, insofar as the ruling class is conspiring against us, it is by dividing and conquering always, white against black, men against women, uh, sister against sister, brother against brother, sibling against sibling, whatever. And, uh, you know, the neoliberal world order, like, it is full of... Um, Elites conspiring against us, but uh, as I said yesterday, you know, they're they're not they're not necessarily lizards, you know, they're not Jewish, they're not aliens from outer space, they're not the Illuminati, but it does serve the blue-blooded bastards in power for us to think they are, and so you know, that's the conspiracy that I think we should uh, focus on going forward. Thank you very much. All right, okay, wow, you're fast. Uh, thank you so much for talks on both days, uh, both truly brilliant. Um, I was gonna ask about the Catholic Church and its relevance, it's whether it's still relevant to modern conspiracy theory or as least relevant as it was 30, 50, 100 years ago. But your last point around uh, conspiracy theory as allegory uh, sort of blew me away a bit too much. So I'll ask about that instead. Sure. <laughs> um, has there been done any sort of Jungian archetype style analysis of modern conspiracy theories and how different actors uh, come across in that structure or analysis like a Jungian? Uh, uh, okay, all right, cool, all right, I like that. Archetypes, conspiracy theories, okay. Hello, I'm right here. Hey, thank you. This was really great, and I'm happy to s to have more information from you in a 3D form because I was happy to watch the panel. I think that Ivan and Kiara had out during the pandemic that you were also part of. Um, I really appreciate what you're offering, and I'm wondering if you have any insights about how we could use this moment of uh, so many people having distrust in the state, which I think is actually a very exciting thing. Of course, the kind of vax, anti-vax has been ver become very boring to me now because I think it's evidently a distraction, but I am excited about this, um, this moment of so many people distrusting the state more than I can ever remember in 30 years of being alive, which isn't the longest time, but still something. Um, so I'm wondering how you think we can mobilize that and utilize that um, beyond the kind of strategy you've already given of just trying to talk to people, like what other things do you think we could seed to actually create more cross collaboration given our various interests in and uh, concerns around the state and desire to fuck it up? I, um, I'm feeling a bit shy about asking a question because I've never done any kind of like academic work, but anyway. <laughs> 
I am curious about um, the fact that you've talked about how people are, um, you know, pitting white sailors against the black slaves, pitting men against the baby burning witches. And it's like, who is theorizing this and how is that spreading around? Like h how has, how have these ideas spread so widely and have had such a big impact on our society today? Does that make sense? The, the ideas, the original divisive ideas or the study that was done that allows me to then critique it? No, the original ideas, like how did it, how did suddenly loads and loads of people utilize the same strategies to divide okay. us? Okay, yeah, all right, cool. Okay, so actually, I'm gonna answer all of these questions. I didn't use my PowerPoint presentation, which I think is great, um, but I'm going to just get a quick look. Okay, I'm going to my bibliography is what's happening here. Actually, here, actually, here's me. Let's do this first before you all leave. Just in case you want to write to me, you have other questions, you don't want to ask them here, you want to be in touch, you want to, in case you want to send me money, you know, that's how you do that. Uh, follow me, write me, blah, blah, blah. Believe it or not, writing a book about the Illuminati and conspiracy theory is not the best way to get a permanent academic job. So I'm freelancing. Feel free to, you know, donate. And uh, yeah, so go ahead, take a picture. That's who I am. And, uh, and I'm going to move to my bibliography because you reminded me about that. Where is that? Here. Um, yeah, actually, I'm going to go through this first before I answer the question. Sorry, I hope that's okay. So, so the, the book is uh, on top is the book that where we're selling it today. We mostly sold out yesterday, but we have a few copies if you want to buy it. The second thing on the list is the academic reference for the same material. I have like a really dense academic version of this book published in the peer-reviewed press. So if you are one of those university students that reads Foucault and whatever, and you want an academic citation, that's it. Um, you, this doesn't answer the question, you know, exactly, but if you want the full answer to your question that is going to be satisfying, you know, the beyond what I can do in this hour, is uh, these two books here. So Sylvia Federici, Caliban and the Witch. Yeah, it's a great book. And um, Leinbaugh and Redeker, The Many-Headed Hydra. They, they know each other. These books are kind of like sister books. They kind of go really well together. This is the one, The Many-Headed Hydra is the one where I got all the stuff about sailors and slaves and race and the triangular trade. That's all basically coming from that book. And uh, the stuff about the witches is, is, is Federici. So I kind of did a similar analysis of race and gender and they kind of mirror each other. That's because those books um, offer that in a kind of mirrored way. And that's where I'd send you for, for that. They're, they'll tell you better than me. Um, the uh, Conspiracy Theory in America book by Lance DeHaven Smith, that's your peer-reviewed academic reference for the CIA floating the category of conspiracy theory uh, post-JFK. So if you want like a proper reference for that, that's where you find it. Um, the stuff at the bottom is more relevant to last night's talk, but this is any case, um, the third one from the bottom is your best sort of um, level-headed uh, historical reference for the secret order of the Illuminati and um, the hermetic tradition and the art of memory, uh, which, yeah, you had to be here yesterday for that. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to move this away. So if you want to take a picture of that, and I know you're all here at a trans festival because you want like a reading list, right? So come on, here's your chance. You know, <laughs> like books. Yeah, I'll just leave this. I'll leave it. I'll leave it here. Okay. And now I will um, get to the rest of the questions. So, Jung. Okay. Um, I would say that. Um, were you here, who, the young, the young question, were you here yesterday? Yes. Okay, so I would answer that question with reference to the art of memory a little bit and be like, you know, whether you are consciously using the art of memory 
or not, and whether you are a somebody who's devising a mainstream media news story or uh, newspaper front page, or someone who's crafting a conspiracy theory video. If you look at like why and how these media are compelling, whether it's the, the, the mainstream one or the counterculture one, you'll find that, in, in, and people, people, you know, critics, cynics will complain about this, like it's not logical, they, they don't provide a, a good argument, but people just, you know, um, believe it anyway. And this goes true for both sides, you know, whether it's people frustrated about people just soaking up what's on the news or just soaking up what's on some conspiracy theory YouTube channel. Like, why do people, you know, buy it? And often if you look at it, it's because of the compelling use of and combination of, of images. It's sort of getting us on a different level. It's getting us on a certain um, psychological level where there are images being put together and juxtaposed and combined in ways that are compelling and if you are into Jungian psychology and believe in archetypes in that sense, you could definitely start doing an, an analysis of the use of archetypes in both of these forms of media. Um, you can also do a similar analysis of like how these images work to produce certain effects in the viewer, like even if you're not a proper Jungian, even if you, um, you know, wanna sidestep the question of universal archetypes and have a more sort of anthropological, cultural determinist approach to what images mean and why. Because um, there's an argument, you know, the anti-Jungian argument would be that like these images don't always have the same meaning to everyone in different times and places because they're infused with meaning culturally. Um, and there's, there's an interesting uh, art historian who's kind of wacky called Abby Borberg. Does anyone know him? Warburg, he's pretty yeah obscure, and he kind of he's kind of he kind of goes insane actually. He spends he writes because he's a rich white guy. He can like go insane and like write books from a, an insane asylum, and people will publish them. Um, <laughs> anyway, but they're they're pretty good, and he kind of tries to bridge this question of like is it archetype or is it cultural tradition, and and it's it's always an interesting question, and I I can't answer it. But whether you're looking at it in terms of universal archetypes or culturally determined symbols you can see that both analyses could make sense and be fruitful in looking at how the images in today's visual media are compelling and invite us to kind of put things together in a particular way, whether or not a certain logical argument for it is provided. I don't know if that helps answer the question, but. Um, the what is to be done question, where is <laughs> <laughs> you it's it is frustrating to see that at this is a specific moment when there's so much to be upset about <laughs> i mean there's so the the you know at a specific time, yeah, there, there is, the, what governments have done, it, it, it's a hard thing to talk about, I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I'm stalling it, you know, I'm hesitating because is, although the pandemic has in some way been received and lived and suffered in similar ways in different places, like what we have, I've, you know, when I'm in the United States or when I'm in Greece, like I know I'm speaking to a bunch of Americans or a bunch of people who lived through the pandemic in Greece and then you can kind of uh, develop what you say based on like how people live through the pandemic in that place. And like you guys are from like all over the fucking place, right? So depending where the pandemic, how the government dealt with the pandemic in the specific place where you were when it happened, you're gonna have have you know different set of frustrations and still be some similarities but there's differences so in places where the government went really um very repressive and very serious about vaccine passports and everything else and um if you're then there's a bit there can be a bit more space among like what's considered you know legitimate critique you know to talk about like oh the overreach of state power in that context you know in in some countries where the state didn't do that much to try and you know stop and control and 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 surveil then even like the anarchists that are normally like against st state power, you find them being like, they should have done more for public health. So y in the United States, you'll have anarchists being like, 
they should make vaccines mandatory, you know. <laughs> um, so it, it kind of, it depends how the state reacted, where you were, like what the sort of flavor of the debate is on the left right now about what should have been done, what can be done. And it's hard, it's hard to know how to talk to an audience that's been in different places. But that in and of itself is significant because it means that like, although there, there was already so much to argue about, like on the left, it's famous, you know, the, on the left we argue in faction, uh, argue about every little minor difference and meanwhile, you know, they fuck us over while we're arguing. Um, and now the, the, f the debate is even more fractured because, like, the what's... C in every fucking place, there's a line between... Like, what I've noticed is presenting this book, like, in different places, right? Like, in every place, there's a line between, like, right now, between what's considered legitimate... Uh, yeah, anti-systemic, lefty, anti-capitalist, whatever, critique of the state and capital. And then there's what's considered like, mm, sounds like you might be a crazy conspiracy theorist, I don't know, going out there. And then you start to sort of, you know, you get p rhetorically positioned as irrational and crazy and one of those guys, and, uh, and that's a problem. So, but so that line exists almost everywhere right now, but where exactly that line is, is different. And so, and it makes it hard to, uh, even harder than usual to organize and collaborate across borders, like literally state borders, um, to develop a kind of coherent, anti-capitalist, anti-authoritarian discourse about whatever, this power in general. Um, and so what is to be done? It's like, I don't really, like it is, it is sad to see, um, and that it does it does make me suspicious about like, and I don't want to say like it's a whole conspiracy you know devised from above and fall into that trap, but it is so frustrating and, and suspicious to see how this conspiracy theory question does serve so well to demobilize us and to divide us and to make it difficult to to organize together against what is clearly a whole bunch of overreaches of power. Um, you don't need to think that COVID was invented or, or something very, you know, wild or uh, what some people might consider outlandish to notice that the people are authorities and states really are using the situation to put forward a whole bunch of repressive um, laws and measures and we should and have to find a way to organize against that uh, with you know without falling into this whatever this rhetorical conceptual division between like you know just f being called crazy for even asking the question like the the problem I saw when I started with like 9/11 with people like you know being divided about like truthers like uh, you know it was like, there's nothing compared to what we have now. What we have now is way, way worse. So I don't have an answer to your question, I think, is the summary. Um, but I think it's a very important one. <laughs> Do we have more questions? Um, we kind of, okay, burning, last, like, burning one. Because uh, we're going to have to start earlier with the next talk, so we're going to have to finish punctually. Take Hi. too long. Uh, is it working? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you elaborate a bit about what do you mean by lefty? Oh, like okay. You're to That's the a great lefty. last question. Yeah. No problem. I'll do that in two seconds. <laughs> God. Never mind. No more questions. No. Yeah, I'll, I'll try. I'll try to make this really quick. You spoke the night before last about magic and how you spoke the other night about magic and how magic can be used against us or by us, and we can make our own recipes with magic. And I. I just wanted to ask, like, what are the ways in which forces of class struggle, progressive struggle, are using magic that you're inspired by? Or, like, could you, what is giving you hope? Because there must be something giving you hope doing all this beautiful work that you're doing. Um. Yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> and uh, I, I also heard last night um, at Dan's Temple that there, there is a secret society giving out um, pills um, <laughs> to people called W or wannabe. It makes you feel like you like the person you want to be, and uh, th they go by the name Pilluminati. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to know if you know anything about them. I'm actually the leader of the Pilluminati. <laughs> Dope. I strive to be the leader of the Pilluminati. It's a life goal. Um, what is the left? Oh my God! Jesus. Uh, 
Um, I'm going to start with the second one first. Um, okay, the sort of historical, developmental, anthropological kind of answer to this question might be, and it's a bit dated now, but like when I started this um, research project, one of the things that inspired me beyond the trying to bridge uh, dialogue between you know conspiracy theorists and non-conspiracy theorists was the um, what I found to be a frustrating prejudice among the secular lefty anarchist friends of mine um, against um, anything that smacked of religion or spirituality. So the whole any you know up to and including like you know the spirituality of like indigenous women in Mexico with whom we were supposedly in anti-racist, anti-colonial solidarity and all the rest, um, who were sort of allowed to be spiritual and religious because they were indigenous and therefore different and exoticized. And it was it was another version of racism in a way. It was like, oh, because you're this different, you were allow you to sort of have these backward views. It was it was framed as anti-racism. It was actually very racist. And I thought, this is ridiculous, you know? Um, you say you want to take lead from movements in the global south, but as soon as you have somebody in front of you like talking and framing their uh, resistance to neoliberal like, mining um, in, in, the, in a framework that that's not like Marxist or anarchist and, is, and uses the language of like harmony among creation and the creator and the spirits, and stuff. you don't, you stop listening. And I thought that's, that's absurd. And so I, and I wanted to write a book that said, you know, this is not only is this, you know, uh, racist in the sense that it's rude and it's a bad way of creating coalition politics and doing intersectionality, but it's also um, not true to the anarchist tradition itself. If you actually look through the anarchist tradition, you'll see that like this is, it, it only exists because of a bunch of people playing with magic and new age ideas in the first place. And so, um, so it was partly to deal with the question of sort of uh, transnational anti-racist solidarity, but also I was, you know, I, I was also thinking the anarchists shouldn't just only be open to, you know, the in indigenous people with their spirituality, but also anyone who might show up with really, whether they're, you know, uh, Catholic activists, Catholic Marxists in Latin America, that's a huge thing, or, um, you know, just your regular new age hippies that might come along, like, why are you making fun of them? There's this whole thing about punks versus hippies, right? Maybe you've noticed. Um, and why, uh, and, and, and that started coming up in the scene, in, in, in my field work and in my everyday life, um, around like the, like the pagan, the neo-pagan feminist anarchists. That was one of the things that was happening at the time that like uh, was inspiring. And it, it could be a little wishy-washy. Some of it, I didn't, I didn't love all the, you know, rituals that Starhawk, you know, organized or anything. But um, there was definitely a current of neo-pagan feminist anarchist stuff going on in the anti-globalization movement when I was there. And there was your black block hoodie guys would sort of make fun of them in very gendered ways. And I thought, that's not on, you know? And so we need to, if you want to have a broad-based anti-capitalist anarchist movement that ac actually succeeds what we're trying to do, you need to be able to deal with, you know, pagans, witches, conspiracy theorists, you know, pe you know, indigenous women from Mexico, the whole fucking range of things. And in order to deal, I was like, the one, you know, all those things are different problems, they involve different challenges, but the one thing that's similar in all of them, you know, is this question of religion and spirituality. That's the thing that's kind of used to kind of mm, dismiss and other, like all those groups, and so I know, kind of went for that. Um, and then what's the lefty, my God. Left and right are words that we use to describe like certain collections of politics, you know, they are socially constructed. This is going to be my like sidestepping out of this question, anthropological way of answering this question. These are socially constructed categories that we have developed to denote like certain collections of political positions. Uh, they are not like conspiracy theory or any other category inherent in the universe. They are language that we make up to discuss things. And if you, th it is, if there are times when you have a person or a group that that espouses a variety of ideas and and it seems to sort of not fit easily into left or right it's because these are constructed positions there are clear like you know tr that being said your more straightforward common sense answer to the question would be like lefty is, is sort of a shorthand way of talking about someone who's an anti-capitalist i don't know whatever I don't know, that's, 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 your, that's your one sentence answer. I don't know. Um, yeah. And, uh, and the Paluminati, that's me. Yeah, there we go. All right. All right, yes.
final thank you. Thank you, Erica. Woo!